Um, well, on that note, I think this is the perfect time to bring in Catherine Liu. Um, I think Catherine's here with us. Catherine, hello. Hi, hi, guys. That was so a great show. I think, great. No, thank you. I mean, it, it's only going to get better from here on out. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get in the middle of the camera, though. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So I think a lot of viewers are probably familiar with you already, Catherine. Um, but for anybody who is just joining us now, uh, Catherine Liu is professor of film and media studies at UC Irvine. She's mm. also the author of the new book, uh, Virtue Hoarders. The Case Against the Professional Man Managerial Class, uh, a very excellent book. Catherine, you yourself has descri have described it as a short book, so I encourage everybody to read it, and it is linked down below in the description box and appearing in Ariella's screen. <laughs> and I should mention, um, for anyone who saw Catherine on the New Year's Eve live stream, Catherine <laughs> is also always the life of the party. So I'm welcome to the Jack Show. I'm not drunk <laughs> though today, so sorry. Not, not yet. You no, can be, yet. we I have no move. standards. Ooh. Try, try <laughs> January, try January. <laughs> Um, so, Catherine, I, I want to start out uh, by asking you about the Aaron Reichs and the professional managerial class, because I had talked a little bit about that before, Death of a Yuppie Dream. Mm -hmm. And um, you address this a little bit in your book as well. So mm -hmm. Barbara and John Aaron Reich, who, you know, I love their work. And, and like I said, there's a lot about uh, that essay that I love. Um, they say that the professional managerial class is on its last legs, basically. Do you agree with that assessment? And then the second part of the question is, why did you choose to focus on the PMC now? Um, okay, I'll start with the um, second part of the question first. I feel like um, after years of um, miseducation within the humanities, um, a lot of our times people do not understand what it is, what class is at all. And the ideology of class difference and class contradiction and its motor and historical power it has been naturalized through PMC um, college educated um, worldviews where um, a, there's a kind of class pacification that has taken place through liberalism. And part of that had to do with this idea of um, 1989 being the end of history and that you know, um, capitalism had triumphed in some way within the um, West I I on a global scale. But um, I really want to revive this notion of class because I think that it still has and obtains an incredible power within the ways in which we think, we feel, we work. And um, more than ever, I think that the values of this class that John and Barbara Aaron and I talked about as being mediating, mediating between working class and capitalist class, those values are hegemonic and they've become, they've become dominant values for a um, variety of reasons. The PMC dominates the media, dominates academia, et cetera, et cetera. But what I wanted to get at also was a sense of history, because I think one of the things that um, Barbara and John Aronach really rely on is the left-wing sociologists from Siegfried Krakauer to C. Wright Mills. And in the beginning of the segment, we were talking about how difficult it was to define this class. Um, but um, Mills in White Collar had a great definition for it, which is even more... Um, which, you know, is one aspect that I think that's important is that he says people who do not work with their bodies, who do not um, suffer bodily harm at work, could be thought of as being part of this white collar class that's like um, a precursor to the PMC. And another thing you could say is that people who work in air conditioned offices um, are able to call themselves, are able to call themselves white collar. And it's always, if you think about it this way, negatively defined against working class people who are working with their bodies, who um, gain on the job experience that gives them authority over the labor process not a credential. The credential does not give them power within their um, job workplace. And Siegfried Krakauer said these clerks, this is Weimar Germany. He says these white collar clerks who think of themselves as superior to the laborers that they manage or the, over which they um, preside, they um, 
they may only make a little more than the blue collar workers that they look down upon. And he says at one point that in a really devastating um, statement called this in the salaried masses, they're so willing to write their own pink slips because mm -hmm. they are so identified with the bosses. Mm -hmm. And yet they don't, they feel themselves better than um, the working classes below them. And so one of the things I think is really important about Krakauer's analysis of the salaried masses is that he says, this is the most delusional class. This class, the, sal there's the proto PMC is the class that lives in the most, um, in the deepest fantasies about itself and its authorities and its authority and its place in the world. So, um, so that historical background is important. Now, Siegfried Krakauer had a very negative view of the class of clerks and paper pushers, and um, you can we can have a more positive view about the regularization of the professions and the credential professions if we look at the early history of the Modern Language Association, which governs humanities professors, or the American Medical Association, which credentials um, doctors. So in the 19th century, you could basically sell like your snake oil and tell people that you were um, a doctor and you could heal with your hands or you could, you know, um, declare yourself a healer without much of a credential. And the a the emergence of the AMA really regularized and standardized and professionalized the medical professions. Now, um, that disinterestedness, that sort of taking away um, the grift from the uh, medical profession was really important. But now that we have under um, the neoliberal and the capitalist regime under which we labor, um, the um, medical professions as enormous, um, uh, as ancillary to enormously profitable uh, segments of the um, economy, like big pharma, like insurance, like for-profit hospitals, we have the complete um, compromise of this class, in part because to get that credential to be a doctor costs the average person like three $300,000 plus to get the MD. So you can just see within the history of the AMA, the corruption of the class. You can see that throughout um, the, in, in all of the histories of the professions. But with um, C. Wright Mills in his book on white collar, what he was talking about, and I think the Aronites wrote, um, rely a lot on him, is that this class is expanding in power in the American economy as capitalism becomes more complex, we need more managers, we need more professions, but he really focuses on the salesman and the bureaucrat within these companies that have to be, um, that are always on, um, that, that are always surveilling each other within these white collar offices. And he says that what has happened within um, these white collar professions is that the whole world has become a sales, um, a sales room. And um, that I think is also really important for later evolutions and iterations and critiques of this class, because this has the, the one thing that um, a white collar um, worker has to do is manage his own emotions. So when you guys were talking about empathy before, we're not talking about like the re a, a profound individually idiosyncratic capacity for empathy we're talking about a reified form of empathy that becomes like transactional within a highly surveilled, highly managed situation. So it's not like you're going to just have become a more empathetic person like Sheryl Sandberg got or Obama. No, you have to channel your empathy in these very like HR appropriate ways. And um, C. Wright Mills already talks about, and Adorno and Horkheimer and Frankfurt School people are talking about how white collar workers and you know the pmc is really really amazing at this they're really good at managing themselves they see their own emotional life their own subjectivity as um a set of problems to manage that's why we have anger management that's why anti-racism has basically become bias management training. Um, it's not about becoming a better person. Do not believe that for one minute. It is about making 
yourself feel like you're a better person, you're better than other non-college educated, non-woke, um, non um, blue collar workers, but it's about being able to manage your affect in such a way that you um, can produce appropriate emotions at appropriate times. So in many ways, like Jen, if you say like, is this class in demise? This class is in crisis. I'll mm -hmm. say it's in crisis. It's in an emotional crisis, but it keeps replicating its crises in ways that profit its own managerial system, its own intersubjective and intrasubjective managerial systems. And it tells everyone else who doesn't adhere to its um, values that they are um, vicious, they're villainous, they're, you know, gluttonous, they're, it frames its own superiority in a crypto religious manner. But it is always in the state of hyper visibility with regard to itself and others. Like one thing I've always really wanted to write about is, you know, even though like everyone's like all like libertarian and privacy, um, now you shouldn't say certain segments of the liberal left are very like anti surveillance. Um, I think it was within the work of Krakauer, of Mills, of the Ehrenreichs, where you see that the PMC loves visibility. It actually loves um, surveillance and it loves workplace surveillance. It accepts every form of workplace surveillance. Um, the other thing that you guys talked about that I think is really important is that what is happening within the credential classes is the profession, the managerial segment is becoming more and more powerful. The professional section is becoming weaker. Like nurses, and I would say, and um, some pro and some professors and teachers, they are lower tier um, PMC types because they, if they don't um, ascribe to managerial ambitions. So if you are just an ER nurse, or if you are really satisfied being a second grade teacher, like that woman who knit um, Bernie Sanders um, <laughs> uh, mittens, you, and you don't aspire to management, you are basically um, demoting yourself and restricting your own um, sovereignty within the PMC. The PMC is becoming extremely stratified within itself. And, and the, quest, the question is, managerial the managerial mm -hmm. category if you want to be a manager of any of other people and of labor processes you will be rewarded because you will be identified deeply with the bosses if you want to be a professional now and just and not met and, and not aspire to managerial in a managerial ethos you're in trouble actually and i think that one of the things that you can see is in our you know really problematic healthcare system where we have and in the university too where we have these highly paid managers who are basically paid to cut other people's jobs and to cut budgets to the bone and to be um lean and mean and under neoliberalism and its austerity policies and then you have people who are actually working on the hospital floors you have people who are just who are teaching like I'm teaching online all the time now, but if I wanted to be a manager, an administrator and tell other people what to do or just like live in this kind of ever present managerial amnesia that um, is demanded of high level managers these days, I would be paid twice as much as I'm paid today. And I'm, I'm doing pretty well. And as um, Jen showed in the, um, in the graphs, you know, I think that um, the top 4% are, doing so much better than any um than the segments underneath it i think that within every stratum right now even within the top one percent top four percent there is incredible stratification so if you're in the top 25 percent, you're doing okay but if you're at the 25th percentile you're doing um much much worse than the person in the fourth percentile and so that um there's an incredible economic incentive to actually give up professional protocols for managerial values and this is one of the things i talk about in the book and this mm -hmm. is one of the things that gets me the most exercise too because what we have in the pmc is a dissociation of the values of professionalism, which I think are based on anti-market forces, disinterestedness, scientific method, professional protocols, and in my hum in the humanities, historical sensibility, understanding of contradiction. Of course, I believe that you know we should all be Marxists, but um, um, 
to, because that is truly disinterested scholarship. And I think that mm -hmm. only under a socialist regime could we have like really prosperous humanities. Be, um, if you, we, we see the willingness of every, uh, of people in my profession and people within the professions to give up on professional values immediately to just say like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll let to trace, chase trends, mm -hmm. you know, to, um, embrace innovative new paradigms. And those kinds of things are all given to us as top-down marching orders from mm -hmm. an administration that um, loves to see itself as on a cutting edge. Cutting edge of what? I don't know. But um, what, what I find so terrifying, just within my profession, but I also think within the American, within the white collar fields in America too, is enormous degrees of compliance with regard to managerial um, discipline. I have not seen um, so many educated people just roll over for managerial directives right now. Mm -hmm. And um, managerial directives right now coming from the university, a lot of it has to do with inclusion and diversity training. We are in such a dystopic state. We just did a big survey, a worker survey of um, faculty, staff, and lecturers in my school, in the School of Humanities at UC Irvine, people are in such great distress across the board. And from childcare, from research, from just lack of space, lack of um, time, the, the damage that's being done to um, our work capacity is enormous. And yet nobody actually really questions the fact that we've also been asked to do additional training on inclusion and diversity. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't work, which makes you like show up to an auditorium and get yelled at by Robin D'Angelo or something. Zoom. We're, we're on Zoom now. We're on Zoom. And I did, okay. Okay. Oh, right, right. I did six weeks of that. And um, but what I noted was the the fear, and this goes back to fear of falling. There is such raw fear mm -hmm. of um questioning things, mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. that comes down as a directive. And so one of the things I wanted to do with this book is to be very um, polemical and to talk about how class formation like this does, it is an engine of um, historical change, but the kinds of rebellion and dissent that the counterculture um, once prided itself on is so incredibly absent now from the PMC. And what John and Barbara Ehrenreich talked about was how the new left was completely um, uh, devoid of any real organic working class relations anymore and was dominated by a professional managerial class. And they were very worried about this in 1977 and worried about the direction of the left um, because the left had become so um, dominated by PMC values. So I am Oh, John and Chad, can I be believe that? What, can I be more specific about why I believe the PMC is in crisis? It's in a crisis of legitimacy right now with regard to um, um, its um, profession of liberal and progressive values, because it's always wanted. It always sees itself as being on the side of progress, but um, because Trump was such an aberration and such an anti PMC id monster. What we have today is in many ways like um, the PMC acting as a return to normalcy. It has to embrace like normative liberal values, even though it wanted, it also wanted to believe. And classically when John and Barbara Enrich were writing about it in 77, it always wants to believe that it's a vanguard class and that it's very, and that it's rebellion and anti-authoritarian. And now the PMC is finding itself like, um, really dismayed by the kinds of anti-authoritarian um, forms of revolt that are directed against it, against experts, against professors, against you know people who read a lot of books and stuff like that, like people talk a lot like me. And then, and so now it it's in, it doesn't know what it is. Like, are we preserving our, are we preserving the status quo? Or are we avant-garde and um, forging new ways of being? So. I hope that was, uh, you guys should ask me more questions. <laughs> we have a lot to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to stop now.
Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that you were talking about with um, not aspiring towards professionalism, but aspiring towards, you know, more managerial training, more managerial expertise is interesting to me because in my research, I watched like 30 TED Talks. <laughs> and, Gotta know about the PMC. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that was striking about it is that there's a lot of salience for a particular set of people that if you get good managers in good positions, then, you know, it's it's trickle down, trickle down workers rights, trickle down empathy, right? Um, you install sympathetic people at the top. And so I think in some ways, you know, they're tricked by this perception that like, well, if I get in this position of power, then I can do good things. Unionizing can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other forms of um, worker solidarity can't do that, but I can do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been an interesting shift. Um, I wanted to ask you about one of the chapters in Virtue Hoarders, where you talk about the PMC's particular kind of parental anxieties. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the Ehrenreichs touch on. And I think a lot of theorists around the PMC talk about this, and it's been more broadly discussed parenthood is um, extremely fraught mm -hmm. and people put so much pressure on the decisions they make around raising their kids. Before I get into my question, I wanna run this clip from the show, Mr. Show, because I think it really gets to this kind of parental anxiety. And it's, it's like, you know, the PMC's heyday in the 90s. So Kale, can you roll this? My parents were very thoughtful and warm and stable, and that's why I grew up to be an accountant. And I want better for her. We're teaching Mr. Weathers to deprive his daughter of just the right things. That way his daughter can grow up to be a doctor, an astronaut, even President of the United States. We're depriving our son of attention for those first few months, and then we will be unfairly rewarding him. And I'm mothering him too much, and this will confuse his sexuality. You're going to be a famous Southern playwright, aren't you, boy? Aren't you, Cole? Aren't you? All right, so it's obviously over the top, but I think that it gets to something, it gets to two things about the way that the PMC manages um, parental responsibility and their vision of what children can access. And the first is that they have taken great pains to kind of um, create gatekeeping mechanisms around the sorts of um, favorable jobs that they typically have. Um, and so they put more pressure on their children because they have to push their kids to get past those gatekeeping mechanisms that they as a class actually installed. Mm -hmm. um, and the second is that there's this kind of um, pop psychology involved, right? Where I think that in their acceptance of retrenchment as this normal state of affairs, right? In their acceptance that solidarity or collective action can't bring anything about, there's a hyper focus on individualism and individual competition. And so they internalize that with their parenting techniques. So I was hoping after that <laughs> Mr. Show sketch that you could elaborate on that chapter in your book and talk about the individualist family unit based approach to education, to child rearing, to um, you know, outcomes that give children a good life that the PMC has a particular stake in. So this, we, you were talking about um, Fear of Falling earlier, which is Aaron Reich's book about um, the uh, Barbara Ehrenreich's book about the 1980s in which she describes the fusion of hedonistic values of the yuppie and the hippie and the PMC in the face of the hedonism of the yuppie and the hippie is terrified that they and their children are going to give in to pleasures. And so they have to learn a new, new forms of discipline, new forms of achievement um, that patently no longer work for um, because the Horatio Alger story is becoming less and less possible um, mm -hmm. with the undermining of social safety nets of public education, the increasingly um, fraught competition for places within elite universities. And so as even as, as the social safety net is fraying, um, 
professional manager class women and the couple are have to work in order for the family unit to um, maintain its upper middle class um, lifestyles. And then you have child um, bearing and child rearing as these incredibly fraught, incredibly rationalized um, forms of activity. And I think this is one of the most alienating things for people not in this class is to watch professional managerial class people have children raise, and raise their children mm -hmm. because they, they are so cut off from any kind of organic relationship with um, reproduction. And mm -hmm. um, they and but it is truly frightening to have a child in the circumstances where competition and actualization have to begin almost from day one. And um, when I was having my son in 2000, I mean, I was hearing about like baby Mozart intrauterine education, like baby Mozart you'd play on your pregnant belly. I mean, actualization and optimization of capacities and capabilities almost begins, um, begins before birth. And I talk about Winnicott and about this kind of parental anxiety that he says, you know, gives way to um, very, very disturbed children. And um, it has to do with this feeling of the parent, the mother as a caretaker or a caretaker of um, small infants feeling like she has to be perfect, where we could say she or he, they have to be mm -hmm. perfect. And there is this like upper middle class aspiration for perfection within um, child rearing um, conditions. Even as the world is falling apart, you're like, oh, I need to grind my own organic um, steamed carrots for my little darling because I don't want anything impure entering his or her body. Even as the entire country is being, you know, sh um, force fed high fructose corn syrup. And, you know, we have um, so many public health problems because of, you know, type two diabetes and all this other stuff. You, you have these PMC parents um, cultivating this incredibly precious way of, um, uh, raising their children. And I saw this throughout my son's life as I was watching like, you know, 2000, you know, 9-11, the, the global co economy collapses in 2001, then it collapses again, even more spectacular in 2008. But it's so incredible how PMC parents were just so impervious to that. The New York Times do some kinds of like crazy, you know, um, sensationalistic articles about this, like getting your two-year-old into the um, elite daycare. Mm -hmm. How crazy! Um, upper middle, upper east side moms are crazy. But it was like such so voyeuristic, and it wasn't really critical. But it was like we had all given up on the fact that public infrastructure for high quality childcare, for high quality public education, for high quality healthcare, all of that was gone. So you had mm -hmm. to raise these little gladiators really from the beginning and you had to teach them how to compete from day one. And this was, this was terrifying. And on one hand you have that, and then you have the, on the other hand, the sort of um, Waldorf school PMC moms who, you know, forbade their children to play with dolls, with faces. And it was all about making working class, non-college educated people feel like they were horrible parents, like they were corrupting their children. It was all about superiority. It was all about virtue signaling, all about virtue hoarding. And this is happening in PMC child rearing from day one. And I cannot tell you how angry I am about that still, but the individualized um, notion of competition, optimization of capabilities is based on fear, fear of falling, and fear of this dystopic world that we're mm -hmm. letting our children into. And so someone said, you know, why do I believe the PMC is in crisis? Look at the way they're raising their kids. It's horrifying. I, no, it's perfectly reasonable to write down every single thing that your child <laughs> says, does, and eats. I also have kids, so I'm familiar with that kind of uh, shame-based parenting you model. I, I shared a nanny with a woman whose husband worked in the Federal Reserve. Like, because we, I was just trying to figure out how to get childcare, and we were sharing a nanny. This woman made the nanny write down the weight of the baby's yeah. poops. And everything yeah. that went into babies' bodies. It's like, I, what are you managing this child for? Like, what is the outcome? What it's is also your a profoundly horrible way to relate to your child and yourself. You know, it's really hard to be a parent, no matter what. No matter what class you're in. But 
that kind of anxiety, you know, and the feeling that every little thing you do is going to come back to haunt you when your kid or turns into optimizing some horrible, exactly. Yeah. You know, before we get to Jen's question, and I'm sorry about this little digression of mine, but one of the clips that I rolled earlier of that woman who was talking about, you know, having an empathy centered leadership during the coronavirus, she quoted Albert Einstein as saying that empathy um, needs to constantly be cultivated. It's a skill that must be cultivated throughout one's lifetime. She forgot that he was a passionate advocate for socialism. Right. And in, in his doing that, he has this pointed critique of exactly the thing that you're talking about. I was wondering if I can read it. It's very quick. Um, in the monthly review, he wrote, um, this crippling of individuals I consider the worst evil of capitalism. Our whole educational system suffers from this evil. An exaggerated competitive attitude is inculcated into the student who is trained to worship acquisitive success as, the, as a preparation for his future career. I am convinced there is only one way to eliminate these grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy accompanied by an educational system, which would be oriented towards social goals. And then he elaborates on, on the show. That. I know, I can't, <laughs> yeah. I can't get a publicist. Yeah. yeah so I, so um, we've destroyed childhood, basically. So I actually have a follow-up question about parenting and also about um, the PMC as the vanguard of virtue. Um, do, do, you, do you both know about these like anti-racist books for children? Yes. Um, there, it's like a big boom and oh, Kale has a slide here. Uh, there's anti-racist baby, which I think is the big one, intersectional, uh, intersection allies. Um, and then not mm -hmm. my idea uh, was a book that I actually came across on like a gift guide for 11 year olds. Um, I had, I, you know, I have a nephew. And so like when Christmas came around, I was like, I'm, I'm going to like look around to like see what 11 year olds were into. And this was on a gift guide, which really bummed me out. Like that's a bad present. Like that's what you get if you're bad, you know? <laughs> um, but, but you guys are both parents. So like, what do you make of this boom? Um, anxiety. I think this is once again, um, PMC anxiety and part of the crisis because they don't know how to translate values to their children. So it's all about creating these um, extremely reified, I'm going to use the Lukacian term again, reified forms of um, relating with other people. Like anti-racism is the farthest thing a child needs. No baby is born racist. I don't, it's to satisfy, the, and Kendry got, you know, $10 billion, $10 million from Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Twitter. So th this school of thought is actually being rewarded by the oligarchs of our times. So if you want to uh, manage your baby's potentially racist feelings, then, you know, you're being rewarded. You're going along the lines of Jack Dorsey. I feel like there's this hyper rational mm -hmm. um, desire to be perfect. That is all about this kind of PMC anxiety because they know the world that they've made is a bad world. And they want to be perfect in that bad world to somehow um, defend themselves from the badness of the world. Yeah, it also seems like for this class, you know, tolerance or anti-racism or what have you is a kind of social capital. And they're really invested in their kids getting it and they push it in curriculums. And I'm going to plug another book. I should, I'm going, I'm going off the rails with these secondary sources, but this book is an ethnography. Whoa, there we go. White kids. This book is an ethnography of um, a, an affluent community that is trying to get anti-racist training in their schools. And a lot of the kids come away being like, I really need to protect my whiteness. That's the only thing that's keeping me in this dope ass suburb that I live in. But the so the parents, is great. <laughs> yeah, the parents are genuinely worried. They're like, what if my kid gets into college and then they get kicked out because they do some horrible thing? Because the stakes around affect and behavior and emotion are so high and but i also i uh, so i also sorry to interject here i oh, also no. think the pmc um really is the soup the liberal super ego mm -hmm. so the super ego is filled with sadism and about controlling others and controlling your own impulses and controlling the id i really feel like 
Trump was the id, ba id bad baby of the PMC <laughs> super ego. Mm -hmm. You don't have like bad id, bad id baby without like this punishing sadistic super ego. And so mm -hmm. um, all of these books are about um, reinforcing that, that super egoic, but kind of user friendly super ego, which is even more mm -hmm. frightening. And I feel like that is the next, what we all need to talk about next is PMC authoritarianism. Mm. Because what so much of this does is govern entry into the creative professions, into the mm -hmm. humanities, into the media class. Mm -hmm. And if you don't obey, if you don't speak this language, you are excluded. You yeah. do not belong. And so that is part of the anxiety of the professional managerial class parent. Like the high liberal parent would have wanted you to read Shakespeare or would have wanted you to um, know a lot of languages or something like that. Like the high liberal, um, mm -hmm. like poor parent. And now the PMC parent, this is how degenerate and decadent and awful we've become, just wants you to learn how to manage your affects. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like more enclosed, more monadic, less historical. A friend of mine said like around the 90s, this is like neither here nor there, but it, it, it's, she said, you know, the average um, taxi cab driver in Moscow was better read than the, a PhD in the Western world. So I feel like we've managed to um, um, degrade um, that Moscow ta taxi cab driver. So we're all just as poorly educated as um, an American PhD. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. This is not going to win me friends in my profession. I, I was going to say, how, I like, don't care. <laughs> you know, don't you do care. mention this in your book um, about how your observations are based off of, you know, your profession. Living in this, like, living yeah. in this neighborhood <laughs> of all professors that I've lived in and raised my son in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, can I give you guys another example of how I feel like rather than look, rather than even thinking or imagining um, structural changes that can take place um, to deal with the environmental crisis, the PMC is all about feeling good about itself. Um, I went to a solar panel like um, seminar about getting solar panels on our houses. And one of the women who had gotten solar for her house in my neighborhood, a professor, it's incredibly expensive. It's like it's fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars, but you get a seventy five hundred dollar tax break. Why my class needs tax breaks right now is completely ridiculous. Why solar energy should be incentivized by giving upper middle class people tax breaks is ridiculous. Why we're not building solar farms at scale in a massive scale it's completely ridiculous. But this woman actually said. This is why I did not get solar panels, part, also because I didn't want to spend that much money and go into debt. What she said literally, you know, after we installed our solar panels, I don't feel bad about turning on the AC anymore. <laughs> it's all about how you feel. Yeah. You're not, you, you don't have a big footprint anymore. And so we have to break that imagination about what progress is. Progress is not about you feeling good about turning on the AC. The environmental crisis is not going to be solved by upper middle class Californians putting solar panels on their freaking roofs. Mm -hmm. It just is not. Mm -hmm. They can't imagine scale. We need yeah. large infrastructural projects. Like we need solar panels on in in fields you know mm -hmm. in, in over parking lots whatever like massive infrastructural investment mm -hmm. but the way that this um um the solar solar energy was incentivized in california is all about rewarding upper middle class people at, in their um alleged choices mm -hmm. so this is what i mean about i mean maybe this is not being quite clear enough about why this class is in crisis because i'm aping them and saying like they seem so smug but i'm like why are they? Why do they have to um, display that so much all the time? Why is this ideology so deeply reinforcing all the time in almost every public sphere? I feel like it's because they're terrified of the void. Mm -hmm, <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. that's maybe maybe that's too optimistic on my part. Well, so on on the subject of kind of like political goals and political coalition, something I wanted to ask you is, you know, you have a lot of progressives who argue that the PMC um, 
can be part of a left or pro progressive coalition. And I have a feeling that you are totally not on board with that. However, I do think that there's a sort of middle ground, which I'll call the Matt Carp position. I hope he doesn't mind, um, where, you know, he's he's um, very adamant that there's the Democrats are just going to lose if they continue sort of pursuing PMC suburban votes. Um, he's saying, of course, we need a working class movement, but the PMC, like, they're they're invited along for the ride if they want. And then I think that there's somebody like Michael Lind, who, you know, you mentioned him in your book. Um, he's a centrist. He's not a socialist, um, but he's sort of identified um, what I think he calls the managerial elite, which is the mm -hmm. PMC, as like mm -hmm. the number one enemy now. So mm -hmm. in that kind of spectrum, where do you fall? <laughs> um, oh, I, I do believe that they are the enemy <laughs> in some way, but I, I don't think that there's a, but I do think they are a following class. So mm -hmm. I think if the left mm -hmm. can win, they will follow, but um, they are not leaders. Although they, Sheryl Sandberg wants to pretend that she's a leader. Um, at this point, it's too um, programmatic for me to make those kinds of predictions. I mean, partially what I want to do is to give people the strength to negate its values because I think it is so powerful still. I do think though that I see within like nursing, within teachers unions and nurses unions, a real um, break with PMC values, a real resurgence of solidarity. But I feel like in many ways, it's like um, I can only negate and it's not my role to predict because mm -hmm. my PMC values means I should shut up. But I do want to negate because that is part of my um, um, ideological mission in life. So I don't have like the, I, but I do know that in 2022, if um, the Biden administration on, you know, only listens to its PMC values, it will lose the great greater part of the American working class and working masses of all races, because people are really suffering right now. And if we can't speak to that, if um, government can't be retooled to make this to make it work for ordinary people, um, I think that it will be a terrible repudiation of um, uh, of the Democrats in 2022. So that so so there is that, and but I do feel like we need to fight. Um, we need to fight in ordinary ways, and we need to join the fight for Medicare for all. Like those are very very concrete actions within the ideological frame of the PMC. It is so dominant now within the media classes and within academia, but the very fact that you guys are able to talk about it in this way, the very fact that I'm able to talk about it in this way is so different from anything that I've ever seen before in my life. And I'm significantly older than you guys. I've seen so much more um, genuflection before its values. And we were all sort of entranced by Obama, who I think is the apotheosis of the meritocracy. And I talk about this in the book too, and of the professional managerial classes. And our skepticism about his um, ethos is really, really great. It means that there is an ideological break. I also believe that we need to do popular education, speak in an accessible way. I. This is my mission in life. I mean, I can talk about reification, I can talk about socialism, but I want to be able to speak to people who have not been to college, who, will, who want to follow arguments. I'm not gonna be like busting out something like the Anthropocene or the rhizome or something like that and being like, hey man, you don't understand what I'm talking about, this is so cool. I hate that. And I, and I really feel like that has been um, crippling, crippling for um, intellectuals. So um, in many ways, like I'm a classical um, Maoist in the sense where I feel like we need to learn from the people. And mm -hmm. it's ironic that I'm saying like, we need to shut up. But in some ways in the political sphere, and Jen, I just heard your thing with Jan McLevy, we, um, within union organizing and things like that, we need to put our you know shoulders to the wheel without without like producing vanguard theories, like, oh yeah, the riot, quote unquote, and let's think of a new word for this. Like, fuck that. Just get, get, with, get with the people, do the work that needs to be done. I have to say like, this, this is anecdotal, right? But this is definitely like some, a story that I think um, needs to be told. Um, and I will write about it someday, but when I was at the University of Minnesota, um, Susan Kang was a, a student there at the time. The um, 
secretarial union, the administrative assistance union, um, Ask me went on strike, and I think I was one of the only uh, faculty who just participated in the sit-ins and the pickets, and I was really shocked and surprised that all of my like far left colleagues who I was in a department of all lefties, they just didn't participate in the strike. And I think it was just like too banal for them because they were like Deleuzians and post-colonialists. And I feel like they would have said something like, you know, unions have to make demands. Like that's just so banal or that's so, I, I don't even know what like technical term they would have come up with. I'm sure they would have come up with something like the horizon of change is so limited or, you know, you can just make demands. That's all part of union self-interest. But every time I participated in, in a, um, a strike at a university like that, I mean, and, and Mac Levy talked about this, you just learn so much about solidarity. Mm -hmm. and, that was there, and that was in the nineties and people were really hostile to striking workers. So yeah. it was really important to have people participating and not in like a heroic way, like, um, you know, just Slavoj Zizek, I know you guys love him, um, go to, going to Occupy Wall Street and like with the, you know, making speeches, like just actually showing up as a body, doing stuff, mm -hmm. you know, um, that ordinary people would do, not crossing the picket line, whatever. Um, but there's like some you know, kind of obscurantism of, in the left in academia that I think really is a translation of this, what I mm -hmm. call in the book, these PMC Vanguard values where mm -hmm. um, my people, you know, my class always wants to do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. And that includes mm -hmm. being a leftist. And it's like, no, just be an ordinary leftist. Yeah. Right. I wanted to ask about that because it seems like the PMC, a, a huge part of the political elite caters to their sensibilities, a huge part of the advertising um, class caters to their sensibilities. The um, yeah, the PMC sensibilities. And they seem to have like a great deal of political influence for a set of people that seem to have no political demands, right? Other than to uphold the status quo and like balance out the empathy ledgers, I guess. Um, give me an example of what you mean. Cause I've well, been watching a lot of football and the advertising doesn't, <laughs> doesn't get catered to the BMC. So. Yeah, that's true, not on football. Yeah, um, yeah you know, you'll see things, um, television or advertising that's like, for instance, okay, Marriott had a uh, ad campaign that I looked at. I didn't roll the clip, but while they were trying to crush the strike, they had an ad campaign that was like, when can humans be humans again? When can we connect regardless mm. of race, right? Um, forecasting that kind of um, oh, empathy center. Oh, I know what you're talking or, about. Or you, like, you'll see, you'll see like ads on the subway that are like for a, you know, um, clothing delivery service. And it's like, mm -hmm. you're a girl boss. You don't have time to worry about this, but we'll make yeah. it easy for you. We'll right. send you a snappy wardrobe, you know? Right. Right. And right. all of those things, you know, th that's just, that's just the business of advertising, of right? Course. And they're going yeah. to find a way to, to reach that class. And that class has a lot of money. Um, they have more disposable income, so they're going mm -hmm. to market to them. But they do seem to have um, political influence as well. So you see Biden, he installed a race czar. Um, it's unclear to me how that position will take shape, but she does, to her credit, talk about, I think it's a former amb or Ambassador Susan Rice. She talks about economic redistribution. We'll see if that happens. She says it's central to racial justice. But the Democrats, um, the Biden administration is eagerly taken up um, reversing Trump's refusal to have critical race theory trainings right. for government employees. Um, you see people pushing policy at all manner of levels, state, city, and federally around bias, bias training for police, bias training for particularly particular individuals. One answer to the um, maternal mortality crisis for black women has been bias training for doctors. Um, so yeah, I guess my question is like, this class seems to, is it just that like, it's a convenient um, smoke screen to say, there's a bunch of people that want this and we're delivering this to them? Or do they have some kind of like, more salient political power or something in those political gears that can orient um, certain, demands that aren't even necessarily made explicit by the class to to be the for, 
front or be foregrounded, particularly by the Democrats. Does that make sense? Uh, it, wait, it does and make and sense. I have okay. I have a related question. Okay. Uh, is there class solidarity among the PMC? Yeah, that's a good, oh, really yeah. good question. Oh, yeah, there is. There is. There is. And this is one of its greatest powers is that, um, the, for instance, the credential fetish. Um, you know, everyone wants, everyone is very discreet about it, but everyone wants to know like what you've, where you've been to school, what you've done. The, the credential fetish creates a lot of um, class solidarity. Um, that, and, and also their drive for distinction. So one of the things that we could say about this class is that it has to distinguish itself in it, um, against the masses that it's terrified of. And they could be like football fans or blue collar workers or people who just like McDonald's. So within its um, taste cultures, the, it tries to, it builds like a kind of class unity through taste cultures. And we see that, you know, this doesn't translate necessarily into um, political power, but it definitely allows the class to remain within a, as a hegemonic force within certain industries. So what I was going to say, though, about, um, I think Ariella's question, which confused me a little bit, was that, but it's also a striving for distinction within very, very narrow um, managerial purview. So you can create this anti-bias training industry within this very narrow purview that and anti-bias never translates into structural change or social mm -hmm. change. And I think that the class is very, very cautious, very careful about always creating like and curating um, a spectacle of progressiveness that never moves into any kind of structural redistributive policies. So in that sense, I, I really despair about the, the class being able to transform itself um, into um, a progressive force again. again. And that has to do with, you know, in many ways, like the Warren-Biden divide during the Democratic primaries. Uh, when I was knocking doors for Bernie, um, I knocked doors in my neighborhood, and I cannot tell, the majority of people were for Warren, okay, whatever, but I cannot tell you how many people actually also said to me, I'm still studying the issues. So the class mm -hmm. really believes in studying, it in this very ideologically constrained way. And so when, Ariella, you're talking about the Marriott, you know, sort of being human again thing, it's still, it is about creating a very, um, a commodity out of a sensibility. And I think like that kind of studying and civil society thing that the liberals say they really want will, um, you know, translates into this very commodified view of self-care and dialogue and study and thoughtfulness. But within the massively unequal situation that we're in, especially with COVID and Jen's segment on COVID really talks about that, the ability to even have the time for contemplation, the time for study, the time for the, the leisure to travel in married hotels, that, those are privileges and rights that the PMC wants to protect for mm -hmm. itself. It does not want to see um, masses of people enjoying leisure. It does not want to see ma the masses like um, performing the kind of self-cultivation that Marx in his most humanist and sort of um, utopic moments um, wanted for all workers. It wants to keep all of that for itself. That's why it's a hoarder. Mm -hmm. That's why the primitive accumulation of virtue is its ideological position right now. And it wants to, like the billionaire class is so terrifying and so corrupt over the millionaire class, billionaire class is so, you know, um, rapacious but you have the pmc in the middle saying oh we're reasonable we're studying we're 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 taking care of ourselves we're being human we're going on vacations but you know in a thoughtful manner we're going on eco vacations <laughs> and that is um what it that is at stake in maintaining its position of power mm -hmm. and putting this um enlightened face on the pseudo enlightened packaging along on its um, on its privileges. And yeah, it is for the status quo. Let's just put it that way. Like in the old left terms, like it is about the status quo. And, you know, Biden is actually, let's put it this way. He's to the left of Obama. So I'm, you know, I'm not riding with him yet. Like, <laughs> but, you know, it's okay. But um, the, the, it's a return to the status quo. 
It's like we got rid of the id monster mm -hmm. and we can be egoic and super egoic again. We can restore our ego through the reinstallation of our super ego because we got rid of that horrible id monster. Now, this is actually how the PMC views working class people and poor people. It's like they're just like monstrous id, id people who um, have no impulse control. And this is from the Culture of Poverty Moynihan Report, all of the ways in which imagine like poor people are poor in the PMC's views because they can't manage their impulses. And they are objects of our pity and charity. In this way, they're very Victorian. Like all that discourse about empowerment and girl bosses, it's all about like disempowered people, we empowered them because mm -hmm. we act. It wants to see itself as the agent of history. Mm -hmm. That's why I feel like, you know, whatever carried along or let's take the values of professionalization, socialize them, and mm -hmm. let's smash the managerial ethos. Mm -hmm. Maybe separate yeah. those parts out. So Can something that go, you talk about, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, just speaking of, you know, broadening professionalization and, and democratizing it and making it for the people, you had given us some images of barefoot doctors and I wanted to pivot to that. Sorry, Jen. No, no, um, let's, let's see the barefoot doctors. <laughs> so um, this segment of Chinese history that begins in the Great Leap Forward that continues into um, the Cultural Revolution um, describes it is uh, this image describes a program that was put into place by the Communist Party called the Barefoot Doctors Program. There were so many poor Chinese peasants living in remote areas, not able to get proper health care or vaccinations. And from the 1950s on until um, the, the early 80s when the program was ended, the Chinese government, the CCP, trained young, mostly women, to be barefoot doctors, giving them basic medical training. They were um, peasants, often from um, underprivileged community, poor communities themselves, and they were given training in Chinese traditional and Western medicine. This is like the dream of every like new agey upper middle class yoga girl. But um, and this actually was an incredibly successful public health program that delivered vaccines and um, basic maternal care to um, the poorest and most remote areas of China. So I was waiting, you know, a lot of people are like, so what's your solution to our problem, our present problems right now? And I'm like, what is my solution? I was like, what worked before, especially in a public health crisis, especially in a time when um, it was very hard to create um, public health infrastructure for people um, living in remote areas, people who are very impoverished, people who had maybe never even seen a doctor before in their lives. And one of the most successful public health programs in the 20th century was actually the Barefoot Doctor Program. Mm -hmm. So you deprofessional, well, you you raise people into professional, um, love, you give um, authority and knowledge and education to um um, underprivileged people, prep, working class people, peasant um, women, and then you make medical knowledge sort of democratized and available to huge numbers of people, millions of people, maybe hundreds of millions of people who had had no access to um, medical care before. And so like the Cuban you know, medical system that doesn't get enough publicity in the United States, the Barefoot Doctor Program actually might be a good way for us to democratize um, medical care. A lot of physicians, assistants, and nurses um, are advocating for this. You know, have nurses be able to give basic medical care. Um, it's it shorten the time of medical training, make it more accessible to people, get incentivize people to go out into the hinterlands, into impoverished communities, and um, administer vaccines in this way. Um, these young women were able to create um, relations of trust with um, these communities because many remote communities in China during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s spoke dialect that, you know, stand, and they, many of these people were illiterate. They didn't even speak, you know, standard Mandarin, but the um, barefoot doctors were able to communicate with them, create trust, and there were hugely successful vaccination programs. So I'm saying like, let's take the leaf from the Chinese Communist Party and deliver public health care in an affordable way 
through also a public education system. So you weren't just like giving people healthcare, you were actually educating an entire class of people, showing them that they had a stake in public and they could be doctors. I mean, they were called doctors, you know? And so- I feel like, I feel like Barbara Ehrenreich would be 100% on board with this idea. Yeah, you know, her book, um, Witches, oh, Midwives and Nurses is about the kind of assault on women who had this organic knowledge and who right. developed it with each other and created their own networks of democratic professionalization of these um, right. kinds of jobs. And then they were attacked roundly when male physicians were like, no, you have to have a license to do this, et cetera. Right. I'm no, gonna burn you alive. Right, no, unfortunately in China, when the, the, they abolished the program, they were like, we have to modernize, like we have to be more like the West. We have to train, you know, credentialed um, medicine uh, doctors, but, the thing is that Chinese medicine was a really important part of their training mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of the herbs and stuff that they could gather were in the area. And, you know, ordinary Chinese people were used to Chinese medicine. So if you were a doctor offering them care and you knew nothing about Chinese medicine, you'd be viewed with a lot of suspicion. So you, you could know Ch uh, about Chinese medicine, but also administer the smallpox vaccine. And that was really um, amazing. Yes, Barbara Ehrenreich, is a national treasure. And when I was doing Great. research for my book, um, I found that a lot of the centrists who were otherwise like reasonable people like Michael Lind, you know, or even like the right-wing people who are more, were interested in class like Julius Krein, um, all, many of them decided that they didn't have to cite her. And mm -hmm. so part of this, mm -hmm. um, part of my book, I hope is like preserving like the importance of her work, keeping that work alive, because it's so important for scholars to re have a sense of history. And I was like, why are all these like DC think tankers talking about <laughs> middle-class managerial elites, but just skipping over Ehrenreich? And I feel like that's what happens to socialist intellectuals in America. It's still mm -hmm. this, like we're, we're, the left is accused of canceling people, but McCarthyism has canceled so much socialist thought. And I think a lot of, you know, I, I don't dislike Lind, but I feel like even if, you know, in terms of like in scholarly integrity, why didn't he even mention them in mm -hmm. his book, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I feel like we need to preserve her work. Amber says that once we have socialism, there's going to be a Barbara Ehrenreich square in every city. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the room. Another. I wish, I wish there was like a Barbara Ehrenreich professorship in every mm -hmm. university. Mm -hmm. That would be that would be awesome. So uh, it looks like we have kept you on for about an hour. Um, so I think we should probably wrap up soon, but I do have one last question I wanna ask you. And this is gonna sound a little bit individualistic or dare I say PMC, um, but uh, part, you know, in, in the conclusion of your book, um, you talk about kind of moving out of the PMC mindset. Um, and you have mentioned that, um, you know, in this talk as well. So I guess my question is like, for somebody who's in the PMC who wants to be a class trader, like what, what are the first couple of steps? <laughs> please write you're, it. You're you're children. Children. Like, oh, yeah, please, you. please do a children's yeah. book. No, I'm just yeah, kidding. Yeah. You're asking me like how to, um, and I don't know that I have any answer to that. So like, when you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. I don't know. When you meet the PMC within, be sure to kill the PMC within. Um, I don't know. Take an objective but compassionate view of your own feelings and put them aside. <laughs> Get over your own feelings. Yeah. <laughs> Is yeah, well, good? it's funny because acknowledge um, your feeling, acknowledge them, put them in a little blue ball, <laughs> and let them float away. Would the children's book version of that be called "Get Over Yourself" and "I PMC Baby"? No, I don't know. I don't know. And just to be clear, like I don't think that the solution is the kind of self-flagellation that the you know liberal PMC is no. so fond of now. I mean, Catherine, you use the word self-criticism in your book, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I do not think that you mean a mm -hmm. kind of white fragility uh, sort of. Uh, no, 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 yeah. no, no. Um, me, I, I, I don't have. I, I'm not writing a how-to book, and so if I was, and I'm only going to sound facetious and stuff like that. But um, 
one of the things that you can do is to um, get a really nice body exfoliator and light some candles and like get a sea salt scrub and be like, this is my, these are my PNC values and I'm scrubbing them at me. No, I don't know. <laughs> Take a warm bath and be like, okay, I'm just going to be like scrubbing this out of me. I yeah, you know, the great thing is like there's so many working class people, so many working class campaigns that are right. already doing this, that are already yeah. fighting for these things, that are That's already right. refusing to be silenced by the like, all we have to do is look within and question our mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. Um, and, you know, we've got we, we have people where we can lend our solidarity, our time, our skills, and yeah. break yeah, yeah, down. That's right. that's right. Yeah. Because you know what? There are a lot more non-PMC people than there are PMC people. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And I mean, everything that I say, Jen, would sound like self-help. or something. like, never <laughs> feel like you're better than other people and stuff like that. I don't have... Um, I, I don't have a formula, you know, but that's but actually, I think, I, I think you gave the best advice earlier, which was just get on the picket line. Yeah. 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 Just, just, yeah. you know, and sometimes -E that, <laughs> that feels like, you know, th these things aren't won by some fantastic flash in the pan moment where it's like, Oh, everybody saw the light. They're won by drudgery. They're yeah. won by hard work. They're won by long, long hours. They're won by, you know, pu literally putting your body on the line. And, and I also think well, you guys are doing already what it, what um, is really critical here, which is standing up to liberal, true as liberal super egos, you know, and just like giving people support, being brave. Like when, um, you know, the graduate student unions here are always being divided. And I was, mm -hmm. I really take, McAlevey's um, thing to heart, which is all about um, creating unity and a time when capital would like us to be disunified. Like, mm -hmm. don't go for the splinter groups. Like, have the discipline to, you know, argue for solidarity. I, I think that's mm -hmm. actually really critical. And denounce obscurantism, mm -hmm. even if it comes at a cost to you because People, you know, you know, the, in the leftist circles we travel, like, you know, people have all these like weird fetishes and they're going to denounce you and you have to be brave. Like, I cannot tell you how many weird, like anti-Jacobin things I see, you know, almost every day. And I'm just like, okay, then you do what well, you do. You like, what the heck are you doing? You know, what the, you're, ba you're brand building on being anti-Jacobin. Yeah. Yeah. Just call that shit out. I comfort myself with the fact that the media is very, very unimportant for most people. <laughs> That's true. That's like, true. I do That's think true. that there is a value to doing this. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, and obviously, you know, I support Jacobin. And I think that it's great because people are always wanting to engage with ideas and it helps them build networks and develop things. But I also think when you look on the ground, like you see a lot more of what's going on. And... Um, one of the things that was interesting to me in doing my PMC research was how much it was oriented towards almost like finding the right party line. Like if if they can just, you know, get that one slogan, everyone's going to come on board. Everyone's going to have mm -hmm. this eye opening moment. And I think that sometimes the left falls into that trap. I think the right does. Oh, yeah. I think everybody does. But that's not how the work is done. You know, it, it's done. It is done interpersonally. And in that way, like, of course, empathy is important. It's just that the left's empathy leads to solidarity. It leads yeah. to you standing out with someone and saying, like, they shouldn't be being paid starvation wages. And I'm going to sit here all night with them. You know, yeah. it's a very different thing than just being like, oh, I personally feel bad about this. And you can change that person feeling bad if if PMC people or alt-right people or whoever it is want to get on board with a union and fight for real benefits that everybody gets, great. You're great. invited. You did yeah. your job. You yeah, organized. No, I, think that's, I think that's a very pragmatic view. And there's a beautiful American pragmatism and pragmatist who was one of the great PMC guys, John Dewey. And that's what he would say, too. You know, every situation provides new problems and gives us new insights. There isn't like some theory that's going to spark the change, but that does come from the 60s, like the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. People did think like there was going to be um, effortless change if you just yeah. got like the right mantra. Right. No, nope, that doesn't happen. I mean, uh, um, I know this sounds corny too, but someone asked me this the other day too. And I was like, you know what? 
be an ordinary person, do ordinary things in ordinary ways. Feel yeah. so uh, make solidarity with ordinary workers your number one priority. Not like some weird idea that someone had. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna stop with my um stop my <laughs> You're in the thick of it. It's, it's, I am. <laughs> You I obviously, am. you've got some help, things to help him. <laughs> you guys are, you, I'm like in the well, you guys are giving me a little light. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm in the belly of the beast. I really am. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, we're so where you're at. Another mm. time, another time, another day. I did take the um, anti-bias training, by the way, Jen. So I have a lot to say about that. I well, I noticed <laughs> how unbiased you were. You're right. Oh, tonight, and I really appreciate that. Namaste. Thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, get, me my, get me my pregnancy parking space. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much empathy for her. Like she was all, in, especially her outfit, because she was wearing nude. Right. <laughs> you notice that about her outfit bearing it all bearing it all yeah, yeah exactly all right guys well on that you. note um i just want to remind everybody to check out katherine lou's book virtue hoarders um again we've linked it down below in the description box so please buy it it's wonderful and um hopefully we'll have katherine on again at some point yeah thank you so much great to meet you Ariella. great to see you again Jen. it was such a fun solidarity talk. Solidarity. Good to see you, Catherine. You guys. Have a good night. <laughs>